right. Well, well, let's get started this morning. Obviously, the, the major moment in my wife's life is the sleeping bag. Honestly, <laughs> that was my first gift. She said she liked going camping, but my idea of camping, and this is how relationships go, right? I have this perspective of what camping looks like. She says she likes camping. Her parents go camping all the time. I like to camp. This is just perfect. Oh, the angels are singing. It's a great moment. I'm going to get her a sleeping bag and a tent, and we are going to go camping, right? And I, I buy her this sleeping bag, and her face drops as if she's never seen a sleeping bag before. Apparently, she hasn't. So I'm trying to ask myself, what's the problem here? You said you like camping. She goes, well, me and my mom and dad, we went to a KOA <laughs> in a fifth wheel with mattresses and sheets and comforters. I said, that's not camping. <laughs> and right at the beginning, we have this clash of what camping really is. So I told her I would help her in this new journey of life that I was going to help her with. I bought this nice little two-man tent. We went to the middle of nowhere, and she asked, where's the bathroom? <laughs> Any one of those bushes over there will work. Let's go. This is fun time. <clears throat> you know, that didn't work too well. <laughs> if we had a relationship tanking moment, that would have been it. I thought I was going to open her eyes to living in the woods, living off the land. And I opened my eyes to this is never going to happen twice. That's, <laughs> that's what I got out of that. We had to come up with this compromise, somewhere where I could go to a KOA and go far away and sleep all night in a tent while she stays in a trailer, and that was the purchase of our first trailer to make amends for the sleep bag. Amen. But aren't relationships funny? There's always this gap in the relationship of what you're expecting it to be and what she's expecting it to be. Or what your friend is expecting in the relationship and what you're expecting in a relationship. And it's that gap that we have to negotiate, that we have to work through. But here's what I want you to get this morning is I, I want you to consider, and we started last week with this idea that what is God's purpose for relationships? There's no doubt that as we looked last week, uh, God said there's these three major relationships that you're involved in that you have to negotiate and you have to do well. One of them is my relationship with God. Okay, that's my first relationship. How am I doing with God? If I'm doing well with Him, it helps me do well with myself. He has this way of pointing things out about me that I didn't quite see, that Him and my wife knew about, but apparently I couldn't see it. She needed help, so she sicked God on me. Amen. And He explained to me that I've got these issues. So I have this relationship with God. And then I have this relationship with, with myself, trying to figure out who I am. And then I have this relationship with others. Jesus summed it up so easily when he, said, what's, when he was asked, what's the greatest commandment? He said, well, love God with all your heart. And he says, love your neighbor as yourself. So I've got to love myself, and I've got to get a good understanding of me. I've got to like me and work through my issues in order for me to effectively love my neighbor. So we decided I, I, to have a meaningful, purposeful relationship that helps me move forward, and that means to grow in my faith, to become the best version of me, I have to cultivate a relationship with God the Father, and then I have to talk to Him about me. I have to be transparent. How, how many would we have here this, this morning? You are a door. Nobody knows what you're thinking and you don't share. You're a door? Okay. See, they came raise their hands because they're doors. If I say, if you're a window and everybody can see everything all over you, go ahead, lift your hand. See, that's easy. Yeah. If I'm mad, you know it the first couple of seconds I walk in the room. That's me. I'm a window. And, and then those two always marry each other. What's with that? You know, the opposites attract and then things go a little crazy. So relationships are important. If, if I were to ask you over the seasons of your life, if I sat down with you at Starbucks and asked you to describe a season of your life where there was great change, here's what I absolutely know without ever hearing the story. It will involve a significant relationship. There will be a relationship attached to that season of life. And as you, you and I know, this principle works both for the good and for the bad. 
<laughs> if you, I sat down and you showed me a season of your life where it was miserably bad, you would be telling me that I got in a relationship with so-and-so and I tanked. It was bad. They were bad. It was all bad. And then I had to get out of that and I had to move on. It's also true that there are moments in life where you had what I would call a providential encounter in a relationship with a God follower, a follower of Christ who came into your life and then somehow lovingly bumped you to, to, to draw closer to God, to be a, become the person God you created you to be. And, and how many of you know that that always starts with somewhat of an awkward conversation? It, it does. You know, he, here's what I know. If, if somebody's, you know, if I'm out running around, because the culture we live in kind of bids me to move in one direction, doesn't it? I never go out there and I'm saying, I'm running around in our community and we're at the store and I'm just so tempted with kindness and I gave in and I was kind. I, I, we don't ever say that. We don't. We go, you know, I was out there. I can't believe she cut me on line. She got 20 items and she's in a 15 item line in the store. What's wrong with her? You know, in that moment, I'm tempted to be angry. I'm not tempted to be kind. And this person who can't count, amen, in Jesus' name, I want to give them an education on one through 10. 10 items. Is that 15 items? Go to another place. And in that moment, I'm, I'm tempted by them and the world we live in to gravitate easily into these terrible, difficult experiences. You can't even get on the freeway, man. You cut somebody off. You're not even, if they cut you off, you're not even sure you want to say anything because they don't pull out a gun or run you off the road. There's road rage. It's just relationships are powerful and they are active in your life. That's what I'm trying to point out. But you have to decide how will you leverage the future relationships you're involved in that you might grow and become the person God's created you to be. You must leverage. You must ask yourself the question, and we asked it last week, what are your relationship goals for this next year? What do you want your relationship with God to look like by the end of the year? You want to have 2020 vision. Amen. At the end of 2020. No pun intended. But you, you want a relationship with God. What do you want it to look like? What do you want your relationship with your wife or your spouse or your husband to look like at the end of the year? What do you want it to be like with your kids? What do you want it to look like with regard to how you feel about you? Because you have a relationship with you, don't you? Sometimes I like me. Sometimes I don't like me. Sometimes I don't like me for a long period of time. And sometimes my wife reminds me that she don't like me when I don't like me. Amen? Because I'm not very likable. And all of a sudden, I, I got to work on me because if I'm going to be the person God created me to be, then I got to work on me because it influences the relationships around me. If you were to look around and look through your history where somebody came and, if you will, were the saving moment in your life, uh, what we call a divine encounter, a moment where God sent somebody to you to help you in a moment where you needed to be rescued. You can remember that moment. And you're so grateful. Here's what you're grateful for. That God loved you so much that he sent one of his Christ followers to come to you, wrap their arms around you, and cry with you, and talk with you, and point you in a new direction. And here it is. Here's the awkward conversation. They're going to say things that nobody else says at work. I remember one time a guy came into my office and he said, listen, you know, here, here's what's going on. I'm getting a divorce and we're in this divorce process and it's all bad. And uh, everybody at work and everybody I know is giving me the exact steps to take. And apparently you can almost buy this list online anymore. It's the steps to take to get out of a divorce and get out of a relationship and to financially protect yourself. And you got to go close your account and you got to, there's all these steps you take and you separate a financial separation, a legal one, so they can't run up the bills. On and on it goes. And he just began to just tell me all of the advice that he was getting. And I said, so listen, what, to, what if we try to save the marriage? What? He said, what, what are you talking about? He, go, I, I, he goes, you know, there's, there's nobody that I'm hanging out with that has ever said that. There's nobody that's speaking into my life as to what I should do 
to save the marriage, everybody's just saying, hey, protect number one. You need to get out of this. You need to make sure you get out of it okay. And for the first time, he said, you know, it's sad that I don't have any friends that would speak truth to me about what's going on in my marriage and possibly give me a hope for a future and moving forward. Now, that can be you and I if we're not careful. We will not leverage the relationships. We just kind of think, we bump into relationships, and, oh, I kind of like that guy, and he spawned, and she spawned, so I'm just going to hang out with her. And when I hang out with them, you know what? I don't feel no conviction, right? <laughs> yeah, you may not feel any conviction, but they're going to take you to a place you shouldn't go. You're going to do something you shouldn't do. It's going to cost you more than you ever thought it was going to cost you, and it's going to leave an emotional wound inside of you for 20, 30 years, Right? But then there's gonna, somebody's going to say, you know, you know, that lousy husband of mine, brah, 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 brah. And then all of a sudden, you know, Christ follower walks up and says, you know, have you ever thought that maybe you're a part of the relationship and that you need to work on you? See, that's the awkward part. That's like, what? What's wrong with you? All my girlfriends say he's trouble. I know he's trouble. What do you got to go and mess up everything? You got you to, you know, call me out? Really? But, but in that moment, what do they have to gain for that? Nothing. If you're a Christ follower, you're just simply saying, I want what's best for you. And if you continue to blame everybody for all the problems in your life, it's the relationships out of sight of you. Let, let, let me just do this just for a minute. If I go ahead and agree with you, yeah, all the relationships you have have ruined your life. It's just really not fair, right? I can agree with you all the way up to one spot. It's like, well, who picked all those relationships? Oh, was that you? So you, so we're going to blame them, but you pick them. But it's all their faults. And my whole life's a mess because of them. And if, you know, if, if somebody had sent, you know, a, a real person to me, what, what if God has sent a lot of real people to you? And you said, no, you didn't do it that way. You didn't want to hear that I got to work on me. I just want you to agree with me about how bad they are. And so, you know, when we, when we talk about this, here's what I need you to know, that, that God is very clear with you and I that we are to leverage our future in, in our relationship with God. If I want my relationship with God to be better by the end of 2020, here's what I know. I need to surround myself with his family members. I need to leverage my relationships right now. Right now, I need to surround myself with people who will speak into my life and help me in my relationship with God. But, but you know it. I know it. What, if 90% of all your relationships don't know God, don't want to know God, have nothing to do with God, what are the chances of you growing in your relationship with God by the end of the year? It's going to be pretty rough. You're just going to say, well, he just, he never chases me down and pins me to the ground and has a conversation with me. You know, if God would just do this and if God would do that, if God, man, if God's doing everything on this side of the relationship. What, where do you step up, right? God's a gentleman. He loves you. He gave his son to die for you. He's given you the most priceless wedding ring of all, his son, Jesus Christ. And then, then you're saying, yeah, well, he's not doing enough. Well, he's, he's trying to love you in that direction, but he wants you to come on your own. He doesn't want to force you because he loves you too much. He wants a love relationship that goes back and forth. So here's what we know. Relationships are extremely powerful, and God has this purpose in it. And one of God's purposes for relationships is so that you would become the child of God he's created you to be. And that you would have a relationship with other people to help them become the children of God that he's created them to be. God uses you and I to love other people and to help other people. He absolutely does. You know, because sometimes if we're not careful, well, I'm waiting for that providential person. I'm waiting for, you know, Jen comes into my life and she coached me and I got out of all my troubles, but I'm waiting for another one. And I want Jen too and Jen to the third power and then on and on and on and on, you know, I just... You know, just keep sending them. And then God says somewhere along the line, he says, but I need you to be a gent. Whoa. I need you to step out and be a counselor. I need you to step out and say, come on, girl. You know, what's going on? Really? Are you gonna, you've been saying that for 20 years, and you're my friend. I love you, but 
you got to stop saying that. You're just still blaming them. Were you ever going to move on? See, that's the tough conversation. But when you hear it, you know it's right. You know it's the right thing to do. It's just hard to get there. And then as a Christ follower, though, they, they say, well, listen, how about if I walk you through this? How about if we move on? And the question to you is, if God providentially sends relationships into your life at an intersection moment of your life to change it, to move you forward so you can have the marriage you want to have, uh, the relationship you want to have with your kids, the relationship you want to have with your friends and your coworkers, and you want to have this amazing relationship with God. If he's going to send that person, how about you thinking about being one of those persons, right? Well, yeah, but you know, I, I didn't go to college and I didn't, you know, I don't know this, I don't know that. No, 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 I don't, it doesn't matter where you're at. Jesus took like 12 sailor boys that were fishermen that were knuckleheads, probably cussed like sailors when he got them. And he said, listen, hang out with me. We're going to figure this out and, and I'm going to love you. And they changed the world. They became the 12 disciples and they did amazing things. So, so we know, we know the power of relationships and we know it goes both ways. Every one of us here this morning has been wounded by a, a tragic relationship. Uh, you know, e even if it was in third grade when I went over to give that Valentine's to Susie and she already got 10 of them from Johnny and my little one looked bad and I couldn't even give it to her. And Johnny's the <laughs> sent by Satan to steal my third grade girlfriend. Amen. <laughs> and you remember those things. <laughs> you just go, what is going on? So the, the purpose of relationships is that they're powerful and God uses them strategically to help you to be the child of God he's create, created you to be. That's his purpose. Uh, imagine if, if you know, we, we love the Lord and we read his word, but you and I both know that there's sometimes I need somebody to wrap their arms around me and say, you know, I love you and God loves you. And God says, I send people with skin on in my behalf, part of my family remembers to come and grab their arms around you and tell you it's going to be okay. And you know, when they're saying it, you're looking at them like, that is straight from heaven. I mean, they're an amazing person, but only God knew that I needed to hear those words today. And even though, you know, Sister Lisa is saying that to me, it, it's, and she hears from God, and that's all amazing, but... Only God knew what I was going through. And this is, I come into church and Pastor Lisa comes over and she says just what I needed to hear. And in that moment, God used a relationship to speak directly to you. Even Pastor Lisa would not necessarily know the full impact of what she just said. She just knew she was supposed to say that. And then when she did, it changes everything. You know, I'm always amazed that when I start to pray for somebody, uh, you know, at the altar, you know, and the Lord helps me, uh, uses me in many ways in discernment and prophetic gifts. And, and the Lord will say, well, this is what they're going through. And then <clears throat> I'll say, well, Lord, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to trust I'm hearing from you, but I'm going to ask some questions. And I'll say, well, so, yeah, I feel like the Lord is telling me that there's a, there's a, there's a relationship problem. It's, it, and I feel like it's between you and your kids. Is, is that true? <laughs> They're crying. I guess we hit gold. Amen. We just scored. This is, uh, but here, here's what's amazing about that. You know, I, I don't need to, you know, uh, I grew up in an era where, you know, I heard from God, you know, and it's a little bit self-exaltation. If you're not careful, you can take the prophetic gift of God. You can make yourself look like the man of God for the day, right? And God told me a long, long time ago, I won't continue to use you in these gifts unless you, you do it in a humble way. And so I, I ask, and then w once, once the, they start crying, it's obviously that's the case, and I know I've heard from God because of the results. And then I go on a journey to pray over them, and then the Lord gives me words to speak into their life. And that, that's a profound thing, and if you're on our prayer team, you know what that looks like. You get up there, you'll start praying for somebody, and you're just going, mm, you know, they got all kinds of issues, and I have no <laughs> idea what to say right now. And then you just go, okay, but Pastor, you said I had to pray. So you start praying. And you even pray over people, and sometimes you're going, man, I gave them my best shot, but, you know, it's like a, instead of a 100-watt light bulb, I probably was like a 25-watt on that prayer. I just didn't feel it. You know what I mean? It just wasn't humming. 
you know. And then when you're done, they're weeping. The most powerful prayer I've ever heard in my entire life is just perfect. You go, man, I did. I rated it like a, you know, not so good. But in that moment, you yielded yourself as a vessel to the Lord. You start praying, and the Lord just kind of gives you these words in your heart. You begin to say them, and then it's amazing how powerful it is. What if, and here it is, here it is, you do not position yourself in an environment where that can happen. See, that's where the trouble is. You know, if you don't attend church regularly, uh, here's why we are a small group church. We want to get people out of rows and into circles, is, is the way a lot of people say it. We're better together than we are by ourselves. And for an introvert like me who likes to go into the woods by myself and stay there for a week and just, you know, enjoy the, the outdoors, uh, even I recognize that there's this huge need for relationship. And even though I'm naturally resistant, my temperament style is resistant to that, I have to push past that because I understand the benefits of it. I understand the benefits of relationship. And so, so you, you, we're asking ourselves, so the, do I position myself? If you're not involved in a small group ever, you're not positioning yourself. If you're not coming to church regularly and getting involved in healthy, uh, God-following uh, believers, you have not positioned yourself in a place where you can do all the things that we're, we're talking about. We're talking about leveraging the relationships you have that you might become the person God's created you to be, that you might live the blessed life. You see, he, here's the problem. As I was asking the men yesterday in our small group, uh, what's the deal with this generation? This generation, when it comes to marriage and relationships, because that's the ultimate expression, right? The marriage relationship, it's such an a, uh, obvious, amazing relationship that, that God created in the Garden of Eden. Not only that, he began to picture our relationship with him as a marriage relationship. So Jesus is described as the groom, and, and you and I are the bride of Christ. So there's this powerful relationship dynamic that God is describing that you and I have to get our arms around that and manage that wisely and leverage it for our, our future. But but we were asked, I was asked a question, so what's the deal with this particular generation? Uh, there, well, I, I shouldn't say it like that. I should say, um, well, there's multiple generations right now that we're living, but here, better word would be the culture we live in uh, if you ask them about marriage, they're going to tell you it's really overrated, probably, an unbelieving culture. They would say, and probably rightfully so, they would say, well, uh, marriages have a 50-50% chance of surviving. Okay, so like if I tell you to go take a, a flight on Southwest, and Southwest tells you, hey, you got a 50-50 chance of making it to Texas, Woohoo! Yeah, go ahead, here's your boarding pass. You're going, yeah, I'm... I'm I'm taking a bike, hey amen. I'm staying on the ground. I'm walking. I'm hitchhiking, man. Hitchhiking is safer than 50-50 on a plane. I, I ain't going up there. Well, you can imagine that this generation who doesn't know a lot about relationships, they only know what they see. If you tell them, why don't you get married? You go, I got 50-50 chance of getting divorced, blended family. We're going to lose all our money. And blah, 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 blah. it's bad. I mean, that's, you know, I'm not a gambler, but I know that ain't a good risk. I, you know, I know a little bit about risk management. I ain't taking that one. You know, so then what you do? You, then you just decide to go the other direction. So this generation, if, it's not, if we're not careful, if nobody models healthy relationships before them and show them that there's a 100% chance of success, a 99.99 if you don't like perfect. There's a 99.99% chance for a marriage to work. They're going to go, well, how? You better tell me how. And I can tell you how. There, we're going to get into that in the weeks to come, but there are four laws. You know, if you go up in a plane and you appreciate the law of gravity, you know how it works and you don't violate it. You can go up a plane and 100% of the time you can come back down and everything will be fine. There are laws described in Genesis chapter 2 that Jesus uh, quotes again in Matthew, and there's four laws, and it's the law of pursuit, the law of possession, the law of purity, 
Uh, and uh, there's one more that I can't remember off the top of my head that we're going to talk about in, in the weeks to come. And if you will hold to those laws, hold to those, you, you will institute those and make that a, the culture of your marriage, you, you'll, you'll have a, a love for a lifetime. But you see, this generation is thinking it's risky, it's a lot of trouble, why would we do that? And then sadly what happens is, if we're not careful, then what they've done is they've listened to unbelieving culture say, this is how you ought to manage relationships. Now, how... How far has that got us today? You know, the older generation would say probably, and I've asked them, so I, I know the answer. They could not believe the world we live in today when it comes to relationships. They are all over the place. There, there are, are less marriages happening every year. There are fewer and fewer people who are staying married for a lifetime. The, the, what people are trying to do in relationships and the lostness of relationship, they're making choices that we never thought they would make because there's something missing that they, they can't get their arms around. So we're going to talk about it, that in the weeks to come. But this morning, I'm asking you to really sit down. And if you're coming to this church regularly, you would say, I would ask you to make this observation. What was it like before you came to church? You were doing life regularly without coming to a group of people that you got in a relationship with, with their Christ followers. What was like before life like before that? And I promise you, I promise you, it was a train wreck. It, it wasn't good. Now, the Bible says there's a season where it's kind of fun running around with, you know, some crazy fun. We all had that crazy fun friend. We loved to hang out with him, but we knew they were going to get in trouble. And the only question was, is could I step back and only he got in trouble or would he drag me in with him? Right. You're just going, man, I, it, you, you knew before you even took off in the car with him. It's like this could be risky because we could end up in jail with him. I just know this guy. I mean, he's just I probably shouldn't be hanging out with him. But he's so much fun. Right. I mean, he's going to do something stupid and I get to watch for free. I just get to watch. I'll watch him go to jail. You know, but, but, you know, it's in that moment you're just going, there's got to be something better than this, right? There has to be. But, but we, make, we make mistakes. But we don't have to in the future. We have to decide today. There's a verse in the Bible I want to look at. It's in Proverbs. And, and we all know this. I mean, you know, the Bible says it. And, and God's very clear. He gives us a bunch of wisdom. But you know it experientially that, that this verse is true. If we go to Proverbs, we look at 13, verse 20. He who walks with the wise grows wise, but a companion of fools suffers harm. Now, this principle is saying relationships are extremely important, and they can be extremely helpful, or they can be extremely hurtful. Now, now this, you know, here's the tough spot. The Lord will challenge you in this sermon series to, to let go of some close relationships. And as soon as I say that, you go, no, you don't understand about you. We've been friends forever. What kind of Christian just turns their back on them? Rah, 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 rah. I get that thing every single time. But I said, well, listen, what? I mean, it, how far are you going to go with them? If they go all the way to hell, are you going to follow them there? Right? You know, now listen. I'm not asking you, and I never tell you, you should turn your back on them. That's not what, what God is asking you to do. But you don't have to spend most of your time with them. You know, I have some really good friends. They're unbelievers. I can spend a little bit of time with them, and then I'm done, okay? Uh, and and, I, and while I'm with them, I love them. Hey, let's go to church. You know, you need to change your life. You know, why don't you step up and do this, you know, and step up and do that. But I don't spend my free time with them. They'll wear me out. I'm going to leverage my relationship. I'm going to spend time with people who I know will help me grow up to have a closer relationship with God, to help me be a better husband, to be a, a better father. If you have kids and you want to be a great parent, then you should be hanging out with some people you know that are great parents. You know how many people come and ask me for parenting advice? And I say, well, so who, who are your friends? Well, you know, so-and-so and so-and-so and so-and-so. And so -and -so. Any one of those still married? No. Okay. So they're single parents. That's not necessarily a bad thing. Do they go to church? Well, no. So, so you want me to help you, and I, I'm willing to do that, 
But, but I would highly encourage you to find somebody who's being a good parent. And they could be a single Christian good parent. That, that works. But, but they got to be a good parent. And when you watch, you say God is honoring that family and helping them be great parents. And you should hang out with them. The wise hang out with the wise. It's amazing how often we choose the unwise, isn't it? Be, be, honestly, they're fun, right? Because they're gonna get, they're gonna do something dumb, and it's it's fun to watch. But but it, we don't grow. We don't grow, and, and God wants you and I to grow. You know, when we we look at this verse, I'm I'm reminded of when your kids are in school. Remember when your kids were in school all the way through school? The first thing you ask when you, they come home is like, "Who did you play with today?" So is he a friend? Oh yeah. Is he a good friend or that's just on the scale from one to ten? And you know what every parent is saying is like, I got, man, if he gets the wrong friend, we're in trouble. The, your, your worst fear is they pick a friend at school that's going to train wreck them. And then you're going to have to figure it all out. Right? See, see, you know it and I know as parents we would give all that advice to kids. But even as parents, we have to be careful not to say, well, I'm a grown adult. and I don't need relationships. Honestly, the reason we do small groups and we will forever do small groups is because Sunday morning is a great time and I love speaking and everything, but I want you talking across the table with somebody in a small group where you're doing life together. And anybody in our church that's been in a small group will tell you that being in that small group has supernaturally helped me. There are providential relationships, relationships that were sent by God for me to help me become the person God created me to be. You also know that when you were out and alone and on your island, that life was falling apart, right? So let's look at the other verse in 1 Corinthians 15. I want to look at this verse. This is the one that we always uh, tell our kids. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 33. Do not be misled. Bad company. Everybody say it. Bad company corrupts good character, right? It says, Paul goes on to say, he says, come back to your senses as you ought to and stop sinning for there are some who are ignorant of God and I say this to your shame. He's saying, you guys are picking relationships very poorly and it's hurting you. I, I need you to step up. See, that's an awkward conversation, isn't it? But Paul is saying, listen, I can either stand here and watch you run around in that relationship and watch you tank and never say nothing, or I can lovingly step up and say, this is not working for you. you got to get out of that. you got to do it now. you got to do it fast. It's not a healthy relationship. L listen, God loves you and I more than you ever know, and he has strategically set up for you in your life and in your future to, to have some amazing relationships. I believe this. I believe that there's relationships out there that even I missed in those seasons where I wasn't doing well in my relationship with the Lord. And there was somebody who was strategically trying to open up the door in a relationship with me, and I shut the door because I wasn't ready for it. Or I didn't, you know, I don't need a mentor. Or, you know, I know enough. I don't need your help. You know, what? And I shut the door on. But, but the Lord, he works in this way through relationships to help you get through the season of your life that you're in. And here's the crazy thing. Once you get through your season, he's going to ask you to help somebody else who's going through the same season that you just went through, that you're now through. Because now he's going to use you to be the providential friend and relationship to come in and help them. If you enjoyed the message today and you want to partner with us to reach others for Christ, click the link down below to give now.